Hello, yes, hello, welcome, hello, welcome, hello, 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 welcome. This is Literary Loitering, part of the Geek Show Podcast Network. We are the Geek Show's dedicated arts and books and theatre and culture and, well, as you'll quickly come to learn, all sorts of stuff podcast. Uh, my name's Graham, and this week I've been joined by Rob. Hello. Sarah. Hello. And Andrew. Welcome. There, broke the hello chain. <laughs> Now, regular listeners will know that we like to start off with a bit of a throwback to a story we've covered on the show before, and this might be the fastest it's ever happened, because it is my solemn duty to report that after the last episode, Maurizio Catalan's golden toilet was stolen. Oh, that's <gasps> right. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> oh, yes, wow. I was reading something about, about that. this. Hang on. Did someone listen to our last episode and think my Willy Wonka <laughs> joke was actually serious? <laughs> I'm pretty sure the show was a trigger. Police say they have nothing to go on. Oh, come <laughs> on. <laughs> oh, Graham. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so uh, the finger of suspicion is pointing in two ways at the moment. Uh, Thames Valley police think that a gang of thieves using at least two vehicles were responsible. A 66-year-old man has been detained in police custody, which is very worrying because, as recent news stories tell us, one of the consequences of having elderly thieves is that there'll be like about 70 different movies about this. (laughs) This is not like the Hatton Garden thing. (laughs) <laughs> this is this is stupid Hatton Garden, no. yes. Don't you don't you quash my dreams of Michael Caine descending <laughs> from the ceiling on a wire to pick up a big gold toilet. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, oh. The other person who is being widely suspected is Maurizio Catalan, who has had to furiously deny that he nicked his own eighteen carat crapper. I, I <laughs> but it's installed in Blenheim Palace. Isn't yeah, it? which has security guards and security and stuff like that. I mean, it's mm. not like it's not like when you go to work and you steal paper clips. Someone's going to notice if he's got a big gold toilet shoved <laughs> up his jumper. Oh, I know who's nicked it. The person oh. who requested it to be borrowed. Yes. Why has Trump not been? I, I want to say fingered, but I don't. <laughs> <laughs> don't think he hasn't been. Uh. <laughs> Yeah. Yes, surely it's him. He's the leader yeah. suspect. You ask yourself who benefits, and mm-hmm. then you realise this is a story about the golden toilet, and <laughs> why are you asking serious questions about it? Wait a minute. There's only one group I can think of who benefits from the golden toilet being stolen. Oh. Guys, did we steal the toilet? <laughs> 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 well, we need we need to have a little meeting, put it that way. Yes. I want to raise two points. Number one and number two. Uh, we need sit down talks. <laughs> this could run and run. <laughs> Don't forget to wipe the evidence. <laughs> oh. Oh. Well, we're really circling the ball this week. <laughs> oh, you're embarrassing me. I feel flushed. <laughs> Toilet. Catalan. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't think of a joke and I wanted to be included. <laughs> <laughs> the irony is somehow Andrew just coming in from left field and saying that was the funniest of all. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I've realised that all these years I've been putting far too much effort into this show. I can just have random <laughs> words vaguely related to the story. <laughs> Catalan has a bit of form with this. Uh, in 1996, when he had an exhibition in Amsterdam, uh, he was given two weeks to produce all of the work for the exhibit, so he stole another artist's work from a nearby gallery and tried to pass it off as his own. Flipping heck! Um, how did he steal another artist's work from a nearby gallery? It's almost too slick a crime, isn't it? It's the sort of thing that somebody who is capable of stealing a gold toilet might be capable of pulling off. Yeah, but, I mean, how did he get the art out of the gallery, is my first question. That's pretty brazen. I mean, it's not just one picture or two pictures we're talking about. It's like an exhibition's worth. That's a lot of art. 
what I really want to have happened in that case is for it to have gone to trial and for them to have a really pretentious defence attorney who just talks about the history of appropriative art and Marcel Duchamp and says that actually <laughs> rather than a crime, it was a, a comment on the mass-produced nature of his rival's work. <laughs> Alan, do you think... Oh, and Grandma said my history of art degree would never help me as a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> do you think Catalan's tried to copy Banksy on this? With the painting the gosh read it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if it's him, legally we have no evidence that it's him, but the sort yeah. of criminal mastermind who steals an entire exhibition... Is, is someone who I can't help but feel a bit suspicious about. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, you got you got to say who smelt it, they dealt it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but in the movie version, it's definitely not the art thief who stole the art. <laughs> that's, that's not going to fill a two-hour runtime. So, uh, good work there, everyone, by the way. We, we really brought the show to the best possible opening. <laughs> We also have an update from a story that we didn't cover. Uh, we were considering covering it, but we projected it for being too depressing. And I, I kept it in mind and thought, eh, at the moment, it's just depressing. But if someone does something really stupid, it could become a good lit light story. So here we go. The story that we reported on earlier was a 2018, well, that we didn't report on earlier, was a 2018 BuzzFeed report on complaints that performers at Punch Drunk, an immersive theatre company where the, uh, where the actors go into the audience and interact with the audience, uh, had been groped and otherwise sexually assaulted by audience members. There, there were also allegations of the same thing happening at a non-Punch Drunk show that used similar methods, an adaptation of The Great Gatsby, and the people behind that one have come up with a new show. Now, I'd like to think that if you've had those allegations against you, you would choose something that does not foster a sexually coercive, anything goes kind of atmosphere, right? Yeah. They're doing the Wolf of Wall Street. Whoa. Um, right. I mean, they're doing an audience immersive Wolf of Wall Street. Yes, yes, yes. So they kind are. of embraced it rather than running 20 miles in the opposite direction. It's the 2010s condition, isn't it? Uh, you turn into the skid, I guess. Well, that's the hope. That, that that just... <laughs> the audience is going to still be so blitzed out and all the free cocaine they give out at the start. <laughs> they're, they're, just, they're not going to have the motor function. <laughs> now, in fairness, Alexander Wright, the director of The Great Gatsby and The Wolf of Wall Street, said, when it happened in Gatsby, we just came down very hard for the next three days, something that I suspect may also happen after they finish The Wolf of Wall Street. Uh, but he <laughs> continues, at the beginning of this show, we said, all right, look, this has happened to us. We laid out the rules and quickly made all the security systems and put them in place. Those systems include... Door security, personal alarm buttons for actors, a code word system to flag problematic audience members, CCTV cameras, plus a safeguarding consent and inclusion coordinator. Have they tried just doing it on a stage? Yeah, not in including <laughs> the audience. Yeah. That's kind of their shtick, though, isn't it? If, they, if they're known for including, you're doing lots of aud aud audience participation, mm. um, then how do they... Yeah, they, they they sort of have to go back to being a regular theatre company, I guess. That would that could be the next big thing: non-immersive theatre. I mean, <laughs> come in, yeah. sit down, and don't participate in the <laughs> show. I mean, if they're going to go that far, why not just do audience immersive hair or something like that? <laughs> mm. I, I think that would be good. I I, I think my. I'm, I'm sure that they have taken this very seriously, and it sounds like they've put a lot of safeguards in place. But I think the audience who would go to a show that is essentially billed as go to one of Jordan Belfort's parties would be such a gang of caterwauling cocks. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it's a way of getting sure. more men to the theatre, maybe. Maybe, yeah. <laughs> I feel like it's kind of. That's the depressing core for all of this, isn't it? That it's the theatre company who are the fools. 
for building a system based around assuming people won't be just absolutely awful dumpsters <laughs> that are on fire and filled <laughs> with like radioactive jizz. So Avenue Q then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we were talking earlier about the news having some quite consistent themes uh, this week, and I think we're we're going into a sort of corridor of lady news, a woman corridor. This no, oh, I, I, it's sorry, right. <laughs> steady on there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> check with the consent coordinator, coordinator before we go in. <laughs> But yes, uh, we have a lot of uh, woman-centric news this week, including one of Britain's greatest 20th century writers has been uh, recognised with a blue plaque on the house where she lived for the last 16 years of her life. Well, this thank just... goodness, finally, someone's given Jane Austen the respect she deserves. <laughs> 20th century! Beatrix Potter? I don't listen to the word you say, Graham. <laughs> Beatrix Potter? Yes. No, if, if you wanted to troll me this hard, you could have said, you know, uh, you could have said A.L. James. But, uh, <laughs> See, I, w- but I, w- no. I wanted to say yeah, Margaret Atwood. I could have but... said Ayn Rand. <laughs> <laughs> I had so many good options and I whiffed. I whiffed this one. I'm sorry, everyone. I apologise. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, the house in question belonged to Angela Carter. Ah, oh, cool. Okay. Uh, this is the house where she bought the Bloody Chamber, Nights at the Circus, and Wise Children. Uh, she also tutored her student, uh, which included Kazuo Ishiguro. Oh, wow. There is a wonderful sentence in this article from uh, her friend Susanna Clapp about what the house was like, uh, which I will now read. Downstairs was carnival. True, there was a serious kitchen but there were also violent and marigold walls and scarlet paintwork. A kite hung from the ceiling of the sitting room. The shelves supported menageries of wooden animals. Books were piled on chairs. Birds, one of them looking like a ginger wig and called Carrot Top, were released from their cages to whirl through the air, balefully watched through the window by the household's salivating cats. <laughs> They're free range, said Angela. It sounds like this should have been the immersive theatre of experience, frankly. That sounds so perfect for Angela Carter. It's exactly what you imagine her house to be like, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah, magical. Yeah, so I just I, I wanted to mention that because I love Angela Carter, uh, and also it, it does provide us a way into the very lady centric set of news uh, <laughs> that we have this week. Okay, yeah, I think I was just paused with confusion at there being just a nice story. Yeah, it, it's a good story about a, a good person being recognised. How often do we get those? Not enough. <laughs> Not Never enough. enough. I was having to seriously think there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, we, we, I, I can now reassure you that we are moving on to some incredibly dumb stuff. <laughs> okay, good. Flip us back on, back into the cesspool. Uh, <laughs> yes. Twitter has very strict regulations about what you can and cannot use as advertisements on its website. You know, if it's by a crank right-wing think tank funded by a series of shell companies somewhere between the Cayman Islands and St. Petersburg, great, we'll wave you through. (laughs) If, on the other hand, you are planning to use the word vagina in your advert, that's a problem. And it's a particular problem when you have a gynecologist promoting your new book, The Vagina Bible, The Vulva and the Vagina, Separating the Myth from the Medicine. Wow, that's a title and a half. Yeah. (laughs) It it, it makes a statement that this is a book that will go deep. I'm sorry. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, all of a sudden I'm remembering all those gynecology jokes from Robin Williams in Patch Adams. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really sorry to bring the memory of Patch Adams back to you. <laughs> I mean, aside from the overly serious, dramatic Patch Adams bit, Robin Williams mm. was great when he was just cracking jokes. Oh, totally, yeah. Uh, that yeah. being said, 
which is Robin Williams was a foundational part of my childhood, and I love him dearly. Mm. Can we not talk about him and vaginas in the same bit? Because <laughs> <laughs> that's just that's just two images side by side in my head that I don't want together. Oh dear. Well, uh, the next story was going to be about my extensive collection of Bicentennial Man slash Vic, but I guess that's going out the window. <laughs> I will be honest, I do have a big soft spot for that film. Bicentennial Man? Yep. I've never seen it. I just, I've never I, seen it. I, it. I remember the character design just weirding me out a bit. It It, it is, but it, I, think it, I think there's a really sweet story in there. Mm-hmm. And I like the fact that it's looking at it from a different perspective to the usual fare of, oh no, robots, we must run away from robots because they're big and scary and will kill us. It's true, it's true. Yeah, it really hits that sweet spot. Anyway, speaking of vaginas. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Dr. Jennifer Gunter, for it is she, uh, has come up with a new way of advertising it. Kensington Books promoted tweets now say, we're not allowed to say the name of the book in this ad, but trust us, you want it. <laughs> right. <laughs> that's vague and non-specific enough. I mean, <laughs> see, that that's so vague, it could be anything from a new car to chocolate. It also sounds substantially dirtier than just saying the vagina bible. Exactly. Yeah, it's just a body part. In follow-up tweets, Dr. Gunter has said that uh, she thinks the problem here is because of, and I quote, our societal inability to say vagina like we say elbow. It is true that uh, Twitter need to learn the difference between their vagina and their elbow. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> uh... It's especially confusing considering Twitter is just one giant ass. <laughs> oh, thank you, Andrew. I was trying to, for, I was trying to put that comment in my head into words, and you did it for me. Thank you. So, in in other woman news, yes, the <laughs> the women have been busy this week. Uh, Thirty thousand people have signed a petition to the Oxford English Dictionary to cut entries that they say discriminate against and patronise women. Now. It should be apparent that I will read any old tonk for this show. <laughs> <laughs> Where but... is your copy of Nazi Spoons of the Third Reich? Right? <laughs> <laughs> I still have it in a treasured place. It's just tucked behind the cistern of my 18 carat gold toilet. Oh, God, no! <laughs> Uh, but th this is the first time that I've first been alerted to a new story by it being on the front page of the Daily Star. What? Wow. Oh, yeah, oh, we, we really have fallen far this week. <laughs> I was scraping the bottom of the toilet for that one. <laughs> As everyone knows, it's been a quiet time in British politics recently, so... <laughs> We can afford to have our newspapers cover stories of more trivial interest, such as this. And the, the Daily Star, which like every single day is something like, now snowflakes want to ban bread, I guess. Or after Brexit, we'll be able to show repeats of it ain't half hot, mum, and it'll be 1973 all the time. <laughs> Uh, they had the predictable angle that this was uh, a matter of snowflakes uh, complaining to the dictionary rather than complaining on the front cover of a low circulation national newspaper like mature adults do. Uh, but I have to say, reading some of the entries singled out on the petition by Maria Beatrice Giovanardi. Uh, some of this is really dodgy. Right. On the one hand, it says the dictionary includes words like bitch, besom, piece, bit, mare, baggage, wench, petticoat, frail, bird, bint, biddy, and filly, which you may think, well, it's a dictionary. It's going to have words in. Uh, yeah, however, I mean, some of those words that you mentioned are mm. actual names for animals 
rather than people. Yes, yes, or, or directors. Yes, uh, exactly. Yeah. I'm... I don't object to them being in the dictionary. Uh, what I do think is a bit far is that those are included as synonyms for woman. What? I suppose in in terms of usage, it sounds harsh, but it does. It is. They are yeah. used as synonyms. Yeah, but I even mean, even though they're highly pejorative. I, mm. I mean. When was the last time you heard anybody outside of Mike Myers in So I Married an Axe Murderer refer to any <laughs> woman as a fine filly? You are on fire with the 90s comedy film. <laughs> and that was Mike Myers doing a dodgy Scottish accent and liking the Bay City Rollers. <laughs> Can we retroactively get Mike Myers' Scottish accent classified as problematic. Uh, I don't find it offensive. <laughs> I just want him to stop. It was very much a movie of its time. <laughs> Put that comment on it. <laughs> I mean, you don't go out on a night out and hear a couple of lads who've had a few pints going, oh, look, there's a fine filly over there. Oh, check out that Bessem. Bessem? Oh, oh, the, the word frail. How do you spell Bessem? B e w s o m. O n. Is it Bessem? Bessem. Bessem. Is that? I think. I think it's a synonym for a Bessem. It's a synonym for a. Oh, what you call a broomstick, isn't it? Is it? I've never heard that word before. Didn't you say the word frail was one of them? Yes. Doesn't frail literally just mean weak? Yes. Yeah. It does. Yeah. Don't you normally use that to refer to the elderly? And the infirm, rather well, than all, all, also, it's an adjective, not a noun. Exactly, that's kind of a problem. I, mm. You say they are frail because they're elderly, and you know they're infirm, and mm. not they're infirm. You don't say. Yeah, no, no, I've heard certain sources where, like, men, as an insulting way, will refer to a woman as a frail. I've never heard yeah. it. It's X Men comics. I've, I heard it in X Men comics. Oh, God. <laughs> Is that what they're getting these from? It may be. <laughs> Almost definitely. <laughs> Is one of the synonyms Dirty Muty? <laughs> <laughs> I've got a phrase going around in my head delicate, frail, and I'm sure I've heard that in a lyric or something like that. Or a period <laughs> drama. Delicate, frail. <laughs> It does it's sound like something. Period, by the way, we can't advertise the show on Twitter if we say that too much. <laughs> All I'm saying is, it does sound like the kind of language that uh, I don't know, Mister Darcy would use to refer to somebody of the opposite Especially gender. Since he's a dong. Yes. Yeah, I got my Jane Austen <laughs> digging in the end. <laughs> uh, uh, see, you say he's a dong, but I never knew he was Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> As a member of the liberal elite who has nothing but double standards and hatred for straight white men, I am completely okay with Dong being a synonym for men. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, yeah, sentences shown to demonstrate the use of the word woman include Miss September will embody the professional, intelligent, yet sexy career woman. And I told you to be home when I get home, little woman. Mm. Of all the sent, there's so many other sentences. There, there are sentences which have never been used in an Andy Cap strip that they could have used. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm. Uh, my first thought was, hang on, are we on kind of tricky ground here? <laughs> <laughs> Usually, but in this particular instance, particularly. Hmm. I don't know. Let's so, yeah. so why not just come up with totally new genders for everybody? Yes. You know, I'm going to change. I, I'm going to change my gender to Fitbit. Yes, <laughs> I am uh, Sasquatch. Yeah. <laughs> I, I I just think we need something that the Oxford English dictionaries aren't in on already. That's quite a goal, isn't it? Pushing. Wait, no, no. Oh, God, no. We have to cut this whole segment. Oh. I've just realised. Mm. Accidentally done a Ricky Gervais bit. <laughs> <laughs> yes. He's got a point. It's got to go. On the plus side, we are getting a large 
some from Netflix for our crap old man opinions. So, you know, win win. <laughs> I think yes. we should come see censored. I'm not allowed to say things I want anymore. My yes. multi million dollar TV special. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, e- excellent impersonation, Andrew, but you've made a mistake. The the special is not called Triggered, like all of the other ones of these always are. You're right, that's why I'll never be a professional comedian. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so, are we now officially protesting words? Completely, yes. Okay. And that's why the rest of this show will be in mime. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I think regular listeners will know that we have a deep contempt for language in all its forms. I'm not going to disagree. Yeah. Mm. Speaking of people who hate language and want less of it about, (laughs) Facebook has applied to trademark the word book. Yes. They apparently successfully Mm. trademarked the word face. How do you trademark the word face? I know. It's Boy, worrying, that's isn't it? It is terrifying. It's like as bad as trying to copyright rice, which they've also done in America. Have they? Yeah, yeah. yeah they tried to co- uh, copyright cereal and um, trademark um, the rice. They got a patent on rice, a particular rice that they'd made. I mean, wow. What do mm-hmm. I call the front side of my head from now on? You can't call it anything, <laughs> or, you, or you'll. Uh be forced to pay a fine to Mark Zuckerberg who could obviously use the money I mean if I uh, <laughs> seriously if I ever see Mark Zuckerberg's front side of his head I'll punch him in the balls and it won't be long until I copyright the word <laughs> balls so I'll have to say I'll punch him in the groin and then they'll copyright the word groin <laughs> <laughs> The only way we can get around this is by using words that are banned from social media advertising. Uh, So, yeah. Okay, considering how much we hurt words, I have to ask, which version of the word book is... Are they copywriting? Is it the book as in the book that you read, or is it the book as in booking a flight? Yes, that's another ambiguity that they haven't cleared up. There must be a very large document to outline the exact precise usage. I'm I'm wondering if it's just within, you know, directly following the word face. Is this the so kind of document that, in. yeah, is this the kind of document that may consist of multiple pages and could be found in libraries? Uh, I'm glad you said that because that was a <laughs> lovely turn of phrase in this Telegraph article by Lawrence Dodds, which says, uh, if it is approved, the term book, which originally referred to an archaic paper-based data storage format. <laughs> nice. It will oh. uh, join other trademarked words such as face, like, wall, poke, Tax evasion. Oh, no, not tax evasion. Sorry, how did that get in there? <laughs> Hang on. Pork is big copyright. Pork. Pork is, in fairness, a word that has fallen from use dramatically after everyone just exhausted the humour potential of it when Facebook launched. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that didn't last so long. And it was just like, come on, I'm not using that. <laughs> it's now a joke so overused that double entendres about pork do not appear in any Ricky Gervais stand-up specials. <laughs> well, this is how overused it is. You could say the word pork to me repeatedly and I wouldn't laugh and you know my mind is in the gutter. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so yeah, that's bleak, isn't it? It's. Uh... it is. you know, I'm surprised that dystopian fiction still sells so well, considering we're already living in it. Yes. Yeah. I mean, we all sort of laughed when this was a story about some romance author trying to trademark the word cocky, but these people have expensive lawyers who were good at their job. So yeah, uh, this unfortunately takes us into the second micro bit of the show, which is about censorship. Uh, we get so many stories about censorship nowadays, uh, largely because there has been a very well-funded exercise to turn it into a synonym for disagreeing with newspaper columnists. 
But there are still genuine cases of censorship out there. This week in America, it is Banned Book Week, where the American Library Association releases its list of the most frequently challenged books. Uh, John Oliver's A Day in the Life of Marlon Bundo is still riding high. <laughs> yep. <laughs> That's not going to get off that list anytime soon. It's quite impressive, really, isn't it? I mean... The, the book is a tie-in for a comedy TV series. It would probably go away of its own accord if people didn't make a fuss about it. Yeah. Isn't it... I've, I've just forgotten what it's what it's about, that one. Is it? Is it to do with Trump? No, it's, it's yeah, Mike, Mike Pence's Pence. rabbit. Oh, turns out yeah. that's gay. it. Oh, yeah, yeah that's it. <laughs> uh, and it's, it's also got a lot of other uh, big hitters of the subgenre, like The Hate You Give and uh, The Absolutely True Diaries of Part-Time Indian, which are always on these lists. Something that I say every single time this comes up, and I will continue saying this until everyone gets the message, is that for all of the talk about how well, the real censorship uh, with all the political correctness you've got now, I look over these lists every year for masses of people challenging books for, say, having problematic opinions about non-binary people or expressing mm. support for the National Rifle Association. Every year I look for these armies of censorious liberals and I do not find them. Yeah. That's the thing, though, with liberals. They aren't. That's not their vibe. No, it's not mm. their vibe. Otherwise, they would have immediately, as soon as the NRA started working on revisionist children's fables. Oh, like, no, really. Holy uh, did, mother. Did you not hear about this? It, I think it was uh, last no. year or the year before. <laughs> you remember this? substantially less good than Angela Carter's attempts at the same thing. <laughs> you remember these, don't you, Graham? And I know you do, Andrew. The NRA's right. version of say, uh, of, say, Hansel and Gretel and various things like that where Hansel and Gretel both had, like, assault rifles or something <laughs> and were used oh, to hunting. <laughs> but, I mean, I, I, I don't get it, Graham. Mm. If there aren't the, these armies of liberals trying to ban everything that, like, the NRA or other right-wing organisations put out, mm. what, what are you saying? Because surely it can't be that the organisations themselves are... Uh, deliberately drumming up all this controversy to get their potential customers all riled up and increase the sales of the products they produce. Oh, no, wait, wait. That is exactly I, it. Yes. This. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas John Oliver, he comes by his controversy the honest way by writing something that will offend silly people and waiting until silly people get offended. Oh, like when he set up his own religion. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Did he do that as well? Yeah. He gets away with all sorts on TV and they let him because he's British. If he was, <laughs> seriously, I think that is the key to his success to his success is just the fact that he's British. And so they look at him and go, Oh, it's fine. He's British. We expect yes. that. You know, they're all weird over there. <laughs> and we are. <laughs> but we we do have another story about a book banning. Um but it's it's a book banning in I think the smallest and most pathetic register that it is possible to do. If like the lawsuit over Lady Chatterley's lover was the eighteen twelve overture, this is someone playing La Cucaracha on a kazoo. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, love the analogy. <laughs> Thank you. A sports bookshop in Newcastle upon Tyne called the Back Page. <laughs> oh, you can stop there. I'm already done. <laughs> it, it has uh, announced that it will not stock the new memoir from the footballer Michael Owen, which I regret to inform you is called Reboot. After he wrote that he was reluctant to move from Real Madrid to Newcastle United in 2005, saying, I don't need to justify myself to f***ing Newcastle fans. Which is a fair comment. Wow, Michael Owen. <laughs> oh, PR disaster Michael Owen. Yeah, but no please. wonder you're cancelling your series and starting an entirely new comic universe. <laughs> <laughs> 
I thought he was. I thought the book, you know, being called Reboot was some kind of novelization of that really strange nineties cartoon, or was it naughty cartoon? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, look, I, was, I, I did have a temporary kind of blue screen of trying to decide what's funnier, <laughs> Michael Owen, like having to entirely change his origin story for the modern age, or getting sucked into like a terrible nineties CGI <laughs> computer <laughs> world to fight the the terror. Of, of the online minister only as megabytes. <laughs> he can only defeat him with his football skills, of which the main football skill he had was running really fast. In fairness, there were worse skills to have in the game of football. Well, that too, his specialist skills are running really fast and blowing his knee out all the damn time. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, surprise. No, no, no. Now I, I am, know a football fan. Yeah, now I am seriously impressed by Andrew. <laughs> oh, whenever I hear the name Michael Owen, I just have a little voice in my head that just goes, Little Michael Owen. It's all the moon. <laughs> it's just Little Michael. Just Little Michael Owen. Can I just, uh, can I just point one thing out, right? The, this whole thing is uh, predicated on him moving to Newcastle from Real Madrid. Yeah. So... What person in their right mind would move from the sunny climate of Spain, especially <laughs> Madrid, you know, where he's basically living a decent life and getting paid a lot of money, to Newcastle? I was mean, he just I, transferred? I mean, I, I, I am not as, I am not as into uh, football as Andrew obviously is, but I <laughs> have made copious notes on this, and I think one. <laughs> One aspect of his reluctance is that Real Madrid is um, it's good. <laughs> good team. Uh, it's very prestigious to play for. <laughs> and they have loads of money because, if I remember rightly, one of their owners is the King of Spain. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> So we're we're off censorship. We're we're off censorship. We're moving on to people who have perhaps said a bit too much now. So <laughs> us then. <laughs> yes. Uh, there has been a scandal in the world of online influencing. So still us then. <laughs> oh my god! Oh, oh, that that hurts too much, Rob. Is this going to be a scandal that we kind of know about already? Like when a YouTuber will recommend an eyeshadow and shock horror, she doesn't really use the eyeshadow. She's been paid to recommend it. It is a bit like that. Uh, I want to make sure that everyone is sit down and in a secure, preferably padded room. Yeah, uh, I've got a nice soft area here. Yeah. See, I don't know about the eyeshadow thing because I stopped watching all those videos after I got through my goth phase. (laughs) (laughs) i hope there are photos (laughs) uh yes caroline calloway the online instagram influencer does not write all her own text wow when you say text are we on about on her phone or does she (laughs) she has somebody (laughs) who texts for her (laughs) one of her entourage (laughs) <laughs> Keep her thumbs pristine. <laughs> no, her uh, ghostwriter Natalie Beach has written an essay in the cut, which, for my sins, I have read all of. And if you can work out which one of them comes off the worst from it, uh, I, I oh, think you oh, have. Oh, is her blog entitled "Life's a Beach"? <laughs> 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 Well, like I say, up until recently, her blog was entitled Caroline Calloway's Instagram feed that is definitely all written by Caroline Calloway. (laughs) Uh, Calloway has been controversial in the world of influencing for a while. Uh, To quote a piece from Natalie Beach's Cut Essay, uh, Caroline fell out of the public eye for a year but returned this past January on a tour to promote her creativity workshop which was billed as a tutorial to 
architect a life that feels really full and genuine and rich and beautiful, but ended up being compared to a one-woman fire festival. She charged participants $165 a head, sold the tickets before booking venues, made promises of orchid crowns and cooked salad that she couldn't deliver on, and posted the whole fiasco in real time. Oh my god. I hate every single word of this story. (laughs) Well, it's obviously a learning curve. I think there is a real opportunity for growth here. Yeah, like spiritually, there's a message there. Uh, Guys, it's just made me so humble, like even more humble than I used to be, which was very bloody humble indeed. That was very humble. Can I just? You were were the most humble of everybody. Can I just point out the whole message of adversity breeds strength doesn't apply here. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, but of course, she's also. Very sorry if anyone felt they were hurt or offended by her actions. <laughs> <laughs> also, architect as a verb, not even the Oxford English Dictionary would stoop that low. <laughs> so yeah, I, I read the whole of Beach's confessional, and whereas Callaway is certainly a fraud, uh, Beach comes across as deeply insufferable. Uh, She talks about uh, them both working out who would try and seduce their lecturer because, as she claims in the most New York upper-class sentence ever written, he was soon to be played by Jesse Eisenberg in a movie. (laughs) And uh, she claims that she got very angry with other people on her creative writing course when uh, they didn't agree that Instagram captions were a legitimate new genre of autobiography. They're not. Yeah. Wow. Was she running the creative writing course? No, no. Well, I mean, she might have been ghost writing the lecturer's notes, but uh, no. <laughs> Thank God for that. <laughs> I have this thing about creative writing courses, as you know, Graham. <laughs> mm, yes, and I don't blame you for it at all. So you don't like them? Mostly no. You think they're a rip-off? Mostly yes. Mm. I think that most of the stuff that they teach is stuff that you could learn yourself if you applied yourself and actually tried. Mm. Mm. Well, that's a comment that might might prove somewhat pathetic later on. <laughs> <laughs> Now, the Callaway Beach feud has prompted the most 2010s internet of After Effects in that there is already a quiz up on BuzzFeed asking if you were more of a Caroline or (laughs) Natalie. Normally, we do a lot of quizzes on this show, but I couldn't bring myself to put it in front of you. But it has also sparked this very good Guardian article by Alison Flood about feuds between ghostwriters and their subjects, including uh, famously the Tony Schwartz, who ghost wrote Donald Trump's The Art of the Deal, uh, later said that he deeply regretted that. Wow. Andrew O'Hagan got on so badly with Julian Assange that he published his draft of Assange's autobiography as Julian Assange, the unauthorised autobiography. Wow. But I think my favourite bit of this is right at the end, uh, where she, uh, she has interviewed a ghostwriter called Andrew Crofts about his experiences in the industry. And it finishes with, with more than 80 books behind him, a dozen of which were number one bestsellers. Crofts can only recall having to sever ties with one subject himself. He was an elderly gentleman, and I remember him coming out of the shower naked, he says. He had all the books for he had all the photographs for the books spread out on the floor, and they were sticking to his feet, and I thought, it's time to go. <laughs> wow. Weird. Just who though? Who was the old man? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> See, it doesn't say when that was, so it it could be anyone who was ever been in their 80s. It it rules out Justin Bieber. I was going to say it it rules out Ricky Gervais then, doesn't it? (laughs) Oh, God, thank you for that mental image. I say Prince Philip, the movie tried for treason. (laughs) (laughs) No, I think it's only only if if you uh, talk about the Queen. Mm, Yes. (laughs) I mean, who cares who the consort is? 
So final story of the week, uh, and we have looped back artfully, literally artfully, to the world of silly conceptual art. Awesome. Always good. Yep. Uh, The artist and poet Kenneth Goldsmith has created an installation at the new Venice Biennale called Hillary, the Hillary Clinton emails, which is a desk containing the full transcripts of Hillary Clinton's emails. Even the sexy ones? (laughs) (laughs) Were there any sexy ones? Does she even do that? That's That's why it was more a question than a statement. Uh, as far as I remember, they were all about the dairy industry, hence the regular chant, butter emails. Wow. I'm sorry. Boo, Graham. <laughs> <laughs> that was a new low. That was worse. I expect you to be better than that, Graham. <laughs> that was worse than one of mine. <laughs> <laughs> I like the little eye of the hurricane there as everyone just came to terms with <laughs> <laughs> oh, it definitely made my stomach churn, that one. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, Goldsmith's work has been controversial in the past, uh, but he has found a high profile champion of his work who stopped to read out some of the emails recently uh, Hillary Clinton. Ah, oh, nice who uh, tweeted, found my emails at the Venice Biennale. Someone alert the House GOP. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> did she definitely read her own email? Uh, write- did she definitely write her own emails, or did she have a ghostwriter? <laughs> yes, yes. It was <laughs> Natalie Beach again. <laughs> uh, I, was, uh, so I, I know we all hoped she kind of disappeared off into the mountains, never to be seen again, but God damn it. Hip relatable Hillary is back into his house. <laughs> <laughs> you know she can't stay in the mountains because then it's just her and Bill, and that's just oh, War of the Roses all over again. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, she, she read out a selection of her greatest hits, including uh, memos about her time as foreign secretary, some stuff regarding the election campaign. How to set up a satanic child sacrifice? Whoa! How whoa, did that whoa, one whoa. get in there? Hang on a minute, back it up there a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> so, did you say it was on a desk? It it was on, at a replica of the Resolute desk from the Oval Office. The Resolute desk. It it's it's such a desk. It's being a desk so hard. It <laughs> intends to continue being a desk for as long as you want it. It's all desk. 100% of the time, it's so desk. Is this is this like the full-on replica of the desk? So if I pop a certain mechanism, it'll come out with a little thing that I can use to find the secret treasure of the, I don't know, whatever cup it, it was. Sierra Madre? Yeah. No, no, no. Um, Have you guys not seen National Treasure? Yeah, I was about to... Are you referencing National Treasure? Yes. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, I am. Actually, adventure film. Yes, I am. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's like The Lost Scroll of Benjamin Franklin or something, isn't it? Uh, no, no, it was the... It was the uh, it, apparently, it was like the, the Masonic Treasure or something like that. There's uh, scrolls from the Library of Alexandria and all sorts of stuff, in, apparently, in there. <laughs> Maybe, I mean, it could be that I'm thinking of National Treasure 2, Book of Secrets. Oh, God, yeah, you're thinking of, you're thinking of that one. <laughs> All The only thing I know about National Treasure 2, Book of Secrets, is that Helen Mirren has such an 80s perm in it. Yes. Oh, wow, I've not seen it, but that sounds awesome. I might watch it just for that. <laughs> I'm a big believer that movies are made by their haircuts. <laughs> So yes, that's about wound up the new section of the story. Do we have a review? Yes, Graham, I've got the book. <laughs> <laughs> got it's been you. extensively You forget trailed. to bring a book, two shows on the trot, and <laughs> this is what it gets you. <laughs> so yeah, I'm just uh, launching into this. Yeah, when are you ready? I mean, can can anyone ever truly be ready? For this jelly. <laughs> 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 anyway, I've been reading Spider-Man Forever Young by what? Stephen Fuchsia. Wow. Yes, that book that I keep saying I have been reading and will cover at some point. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I mean, I can't talk, to be honest. I've been reading uh, Animal by Sarah Pascoe for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Graham, it's your book. It's fine. <laughs> is, is it future societies are going to be split pre and post Sarah reading Animal by Sarah Pascoe? <laughs> <laughs> With just kind of the lost years in between. <laughs> the dark ages. Wilderness years. So yeah, this is a, an official Marvel novel uh, based on the, the classic Stone Tablet Saga comics, which classic classic is an optimistic word they've used. <laughs> but the, you know, not that they're necessarily bad comics. It's just mm. I feel like when people are talking about the great Spider-Man stories, that one time he had to fight a really old man from getting like the elixir of youth from a special tablet, <laughs> a big stone tablet, not like not like a paracetamol. Yes, is, is maybe maybe not among them. Is that the one where <laughs> is that the Aztec stone tablet thing that was on top of the pyramid? I think it. I think it's a Mayan tablet or oh, something. Mayan Aztec, same kind of area. Oh, you yeah. big extinct civilization racist. No, it's just, I think they did that story in the Spider-Man cartoon. Probably. The, you know, the fox where, kids. Where are the Mayans from? South America. Are they? Well, mm. there were actually uh, aliens that parked in South America. <laughs> of course, yeah. Obviously, yes, yeah, sorry. Duh. The History Channel said it, so it must be true. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, so uh, this story follows Spider-Man, Peter Parker. He's in college, having his classic Peter Parker problems, you know. His, his bent's late and he's got to see Aunt May and he's got to make time for Gwen Stacy, but he keeps blowing her off and so she's mad at him and he's he keeps failing all his classes. <laughs> it's a perfectly valid euphemism for not seeing <laughs> someone. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> We're all going to go lame gag crazy, then I'm in there. <laughs> I'm here for that. <laughs> oh, that are you done? Is that out your system? <laughs> Sorry, Andrew. <laughs> Good. This is, this is a serious arts and book show, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, Spider-Man. He's, he's got rid of his spider powers. He's, he gets involved in a plot between the Kingpin, who is a gangster, who who is fat in ways that are maybe now slightly uncomfortable? <laughs> Unless you're a sumo wrestler, yeah, it's it's fine. It's all muscle, yeah. baby. Well, then maybe Spider-Man cracking constant fat jokes. That's fine. No, that's that not that's that, that's, that's not good. And yeah, problematic in this day and age. That's not good. I mean, if it was somebody shouting those things at me. I'd A, punch him in the balls, and B, start crying. <laughs> <laughs> in that order. Yeah, so Kingpin wants it, as does a gangster named Silvermane, who is the aforementioned old man. His superpower is being old. But, <laughs> I, just hold on one second. Didn't the vulture grow younger by absorbing the life force of people at one point? Yes, look. If we're going to talk about Spider-Man <laughs> plots that have no relevance to this story, we're going to be here all day. <laughs> Although, speaking of that, that does dovetail nicely into a weird criticism of this book, is that it seems weirdly like devoted to adapting the actual story of the comics, right. including a bit where, like, basically at the start, Peter meets up with his friend Harry Osborn who is uh, the son of the Green Goblin. Mm. And basically, they have a big chat about, you know, how no one's seen Norman for a while, and he's worried that something might have happened to him. Mm. Which, in the comics, is, of course, setting up the fact that Norman's slipped back into his Green Goblin persona, and that, you know, sets off the chain of events that eventually leads to Gwen Stacy's death. In the book, that's a plot point that's not really followed up on at all. <laughs> right. <laughs> It's, again, it's, it's a weird choice that it adapts just the actual content of the comics rather than, you know, taking like the basic story and reworking it into something that works as a standalone novel. Because mm. also, I did tell a bit of a lie. The uh, Green Goblin killing Gwen Stacy does factor into this book a little tiny bit. Because uh, this book has a part one and a part two. 
Mm. Part one ending kind of where this original comic story from the 60s ends with, you know, Spider-Man, he beats Silver Maid. Well, Silver Maid actually uses the tablet, starts getting younger. You know, classic fantasy film thing, starts getting younger and younger, ages until he's just like a baby and then vanishes into nothing. Mm. <laughs> and, you know, end of story, everything's hunky-dory. Smash cut to part two, two years later, literally starts with Spider-Man being all, oh, Gwen Stacy's dead, I'm sad now. Oh, God. Because it also adapts, like, another comic book story from a few years later. Right. And that's what I mean by it being, like, a really weird choice to just have, like, the story stop and then pick up again with this. By the way, a bunch of stuff happened in between chapters. Yes. <laughs> Boy, has it been a busy summer. Yeah, half the cast is dead and Harry Osborne's a drug addict now. <laughs> yeah, so that's one of the big criticisms I'd have of this book. Uh, another one, I would say, I think, again, I hinted at it earlier, is there's there's a few story beats that, like, as much as this book has tried to adapt things into the modern day by, like, having characters have mobile phones and stuff, mm. There's a lot of, like, 60s era stuff that's quite problematic, especially with regards to female characters. Mm. <laughs> and I think yeah. one of the big things that I really realised is, you know, Peter having this whole thing of, oh, no, I, I love Gwen Stacy, but she's all mad at me because I keep, you know, abandoning our dates to go do Spider-Man stuff, but I can't tell her I'm Spider-Man. So I just have to make up these, you know, half-hearted excuses. I think mm. the main reason why comics don't really do that now is that's quite a bit like gaslighting. Mm. Yes. <laughs> Very much the fuck when you think I keep running away from you. No, you're the crazy one. <laughs> I just... just invented it. How about you go and have a, la a lie down in a nice lady room? <laughs> yeah. it, is, it is just a bit of spaghetti. -o. <laughs> and. Thirdly, to kind of wind up the trifecta of problems I have with this book, mm. it's the uh, the thing I foreshadowed with Rob, in that this is very much written by a man who has completed a creative writing course. Right. See what which I mean? I think uh, it's it's a problem I've kind of come across with quite a few things that I get given for this show. Of uh, you can you can always tell when they've had that same kind of course training. Right. Just because just cause everything reads a bit like you can tell they have been told this is how you structure a story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Rather than like developing their own style. It's kind of like, you know how when you're in school and you're doing science in school and they tell you to do your science report in a certain way. Yeah. So when you get to university, if you're still doing science... You probably won't use that, but it's in your head that that is the structure, the basic structure that you follow. Mm. And that's my biggest problem with creative writing courses is that they really, really dampen your own style. Mm. Yeah. They force yeah, you to like, adopt a style that's not yours. Yeah, and you can always tell what like, they've been told, okay, it's the start of a new chapter, so you need to introduce the characters and set up the scene. So it's like... Literally every chapter always starts with, Peter walked into the room. It was a big room. There was a coffee cup on the table. <laughs> and and what is the bane of my life with books like this, which is the need to describe every single minute detail of every single scene. Oh, yes, the Tolstoy approach. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I think there's one ridiculous bit where Spider-Man, like, he has to go rescue a scientist who's been captured by Silvermane, and so he starts crawling along the wall to get to him, and you could just write, Spider-Man crawled along the wall, but nope, it's got to be like, Spider-Man pushed his elbow out and splayed his fingers apart, <laughs> you know, yeah. gripping onto the wall, he pulled his arm forward, then he put his other arm forward. <laughs> this is definitely the like, Tolstoy approach. <laughs> And especially in the more, like, action-oriented scenes, it's a lot of, you know, missing the wood for the trees. 
Yeah. But you're focusing so much on like the tiny details of how Spider Man's moving every part of his body, kind of lose the thread of like what's actually going on in the scene. Mm. Mm. Oh, God. Now I'm just imagining how he'd describe that, you know, the Korean Spider Man statue. Spider Man's muscles <laughs> bulged in an unfortunate way. <laughs> <laughs> that being said, I think it, it is still essentially just a fun little Spider Man story. Like, I think Stefan Petrucci, you know, he makes the characters sound like the characters. Yeah. I mean, it's hard to credit him too much with, you know, the plot or anything, since he mostly just seems to be copying things that, like, Stanley and I think Jerry Conway wrote. Yeah, because yeah. it was the original Forever Young, oh, the Stone Tablet Saga was 1960s, wasn't it? Yeah. Actually, no, I do. The original Stone Tablet Saga does is slightly famous as a Spider-Man story, because that was one of the ones that Steve Ditko, not Stan Lee, scripted. Ah. And so you've got a weird bit where, like, Spider-Man sees a bunch of protesters and gets super, like, Randian on them, being all damn protesters. They should be getting a job, earning for themselves. Right, okay, I was a little bit confused as to what you actually said there. Yeah, I yeah, also heard Randy, Randy, yeah. which would be a much better mm. story. <laughs> I was yeah, like, oh, that's lovely. <laughs> Randy and was not the best choice of words, but yeah, the point still stands. Steve Ditko, influential, like, responsible for some great comic characters. Bad guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just, I think the way this book works best is if you're a fan of these comics and want what is like essentially a director's cut of the story because mm. you know this beefs out certain things it is uh something i do like that it does is it has chapters from this perspective of characters who aren't spider-man mm. so you get a bit like from silvermane he's quite a fun character because like yeah, dude, he's, he's this Magia boss who's clearly past it and, like, is even starting to lose his mind a bit. But is really determined, like, no, he doesn't want to show any weakness at all. Even, like, when he forgets, like, what his main lieutenant's name is. And, yeah. Or what the important task he sent him off to do is. Did you say Magia boss? Yes, Magia. Oh, yeah, that's oh, a thing. <laughs> so back in the <laughs> 1960s, Marvel legally weren't allowed to call their, their gangs the Mafia. <laughs> Did the Mafia, like, launch a Facebook-style copyright suit or something? <laughs> I know that this was back when it was probably, like, the Mafia is a legitimate business organisation, so we will sue any company that dare suggest we might be involved in illegitimate exercises. <laughs> the, the, the problem I've got is, now in a post-Harry Potter world, right... The word Magia mm. usually refers to something to do with wizards or magic or something like that. <laughs> I thought you just meant Hungarian. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Silverman, leader of the Hungarian wizards. <laughs> yeah, that, that's about all I have to say about this book. Bit of a mixed bag. <laughs> <laughs> so we know what you've been reading, and we know what Sarah's been reading. Slowly. Uh, well, what Sarah's still reading. <laughs> what there is, is still projected to be reading for some time. Uh, Rob, what have you been reading? In my defence, I'm not reading one book at a time, though. It's fine. Yeah. I oh, I read. Uh, I, I've been reading trash. Right. I mean, quite literally, it's trash fiction. I'm still on my Eastern trash fiction binge. <laughs> right. Um, I, I don't, I, I don't know. I ended up reading, uh, reading something called Valhalla Saga, which uh, is about a Korean pro gamer who dies and ends up in Valhalla. It's very Nordic and very, very, very trashy. And <laughs> I'll be honest, I kind of liked it because it was all about Ragnarok and you had Thor and everyone like that. And I was like, oh yeah, cool, Thor's here. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. I'm excited to announce that I've been reading and loving Milkman by Anna Burns. Right, what's that about? It's is it about a milkman? It is about a milkman. Uh, mm. We were discussing it before and we decided it probably was a gritty retelling of the Pat Mustard episode of Father Ted. <laughs> wow. 
uh, but yeah, I'm I'm it's the one that won the Booker a few years back and Anna Burns, the writer, famously said the first thing she'd have to do after this was contact the DWP and tell them that she'd just had a pretty incredible change of circumstances. <laughs> and cool. Milkman is a tale of an 18-year-old girl who's being stalked by what she initially interprets as an old perv in her unnamed Northern Irish village, but she later comes to realise might be tied up with some wider aspect of the troubles, that he might be a, a sort of a made man, as the Magia would say. Right. <laughs> <laughs> And it's excellent. It's so great. It's the best new novel I've read since Hilary Mantle's Beyond Black. I love it so much. Oh, wow. It's got a lot of uh, pressing. It was a very difficult novel when it came out. But the, the thing that is most ostentatiously experimental about it is the fact that none of the characters have names. They just have descriptions, which if you've got terrible memory for those names like me, makes it less difficult than a normal novel. Oh, that's cool. I would probably enjoy that more. Mm. <laughs> oh my god, it's just like all the people I know in real life. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, uh, should we wind it up? Yeah. Yes, yes, we should. Smart host. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, right. Uh, so if you uh, want to catch any of our other episodes of Literary Loitering, or indeed any of the other shows that are part of the Geek Show podcast family, then you can find them all on our website, thegeekshow.co.uk, where you'll also find video game reviews, movie reviews, and all sorts of other stuff, as well as our Patreon and our shop. And if you want to get in touch with us, you can email us, studio at thegeekshow.co.uk, if you want to get involved or you uh, just want some information about who we are and what we do, then do get in touch with us. Uh, You'll also find us on Facebook and Twitter as well. Just look for The Geek Show. Until next time, then, I have been Rob. I've been Andrew. I've been Sarah. And I've been Graham. (laughs) Nearly. (laughs) And we will see you all later. Thanks for listening.